side of the planet and good evening to those and Tracy's. As you can see from her background, it's dark, but she's super ready to give and start this Bible study. We're on our fourth session today of security and significance and session four is run to win. So Tracy mentioned this is one of her favorite sessions. So you're in for a good one today. So um, take it away, Tracy. We're excited for you to start. Hey guys, welcome those of you who are with us tonight and everybody else who will be watching later. Um, I am really excited about tonight. Um, before we start, let me pray really fast. You might notice that I'm in a different place. I'm actually in a hotel room in Florida. I'm on a trip visiting my daughter who's in college in Florida and it's parents weekend. So um, I'm down here. And so one of the things I wanna pray for is that the Wi-Fi will hold. <laughs> and then I'll be able to see the screen's a lot smaller than at home. All right, uh, Lord, I know you hear these things. I know that your word says you start answering our prayers before we even finish asking them. Thank you so much that you're so good, that you do that, that you're with us. Please help me say the things that need to be said and forget the things that don't. May all this bring honor and glory to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so first I wanna start with a um, super brief review. But I just kind of want to go back. In the very beginning, we talked about um, thought, thinking about our lives as a story, um, as a story within a bigger story, within the greatest story ever told, the true story of um, the creator God entering his creation to rescue mankind, and to make creation perfect again, too. We talked about how we all have a longing to be part of something bigger than ourselves and to live a life that's meaningful and to do something that's significant or important. And that, that's not wrong, but that's part and parcel of being human. It's part and parcel of being made in the image of the creator God. Um, and that that creator God, the creator of the universe, also happens to be, uh, scripture calls him our Abba or our daddy. And that he has created things in a life specially for you, especially for each one of us. And he, along with the Holy Spirit, are inviting us to come along on this adventure and do these things that he's prepared for us. Um, and do them not in a way that the world says is right or makes sense, and not even in a way that might make sense, but to do them in the way that he tells us is for our good and the world's good and his glory. So then the last two weeks, we kind of looked at the very beginning of our adventure and then the very end of our adventure. So the beginning, I use this analogy of buckling your seatbelt. And um, that is our salvation from hell to heaven, if you will. It's um, just looking at Jesus and what he did on the cross, believing he's who he said he was and that he's the answer for our sin problem. And at that moment, at that moment, we believe he gives us a gift of salvation. And he says, you are my child and you will always be my child. He promises this perfect, perfect security that's based on his perfect love and not all the imperfect, terrible things that we may or may not do. That love that can't be frayed, that can't be changed, that can't be diminished. And then next week, I mean last week, excuse me, we looked at the end of our journey, um, heaven, if you will, or um, the new heaven and the new earth. And it, that's this exciting, motivating conclusion to our time on earth and the beginning of our eternal life. And we also looked at all the pieces of heaven and all the things he's got designed perfectly for us. Um, so this week, and really the rest of this study, I wanna focus on how. Like, how do we live this time in between buckling our seatbelt and becoming a child of God through eternity? What do we do with it, right? Like that's the bulk of our life. And honestly, that's the bulk of what scripture talks to us about. It doesn't go over and over and over and over about how to be saved from hell to heaven because um, honestly, it's a, it's a simple act of faith. Um, but then how we live our lives is it, it is, it becomes our story and it impacts um, not only how we live our life on this earth, but it impacts maximizing our joy in the life to come. So, how? How do we maximize our time between being born again as an eternally secure child of God and entering into heaven? But if you think about that, if I'm saying let's spend tonight and the next few weeks talking about how, 
in light of this security and in light of heaven we should live, um, it first raises a couple of questions. Um, the first one I'd say, if we are eternally secure and there's nothing we can do to lose your salvation, you're perfectly secure. Does it really matter how you live now? And if there's nothing you can do that can cause God to love you less, does it really matter what you do? Can we even do anything to impact our time? And the answer is yes, it does matter. It matters immensely. It impacts not only how we live our lives here, it impacts those around us, and it impacts our eternity. Um, I want to be super, super clear about this. And in fact, I'm gonna give you kind of this overarching framework and then give you some different um, ways that, um, Christians and theologians use different terms to talk about this, this distinction between our eternal security and the importance of how we live. Um, but it's so important, and I'm afraid that this is a, an area in the church that isn't talked about very much. It's all kind of um, enmeshed and made into one kind of mushy, sane thing that's like how you live, does it get you, what gets you to heaven, how, and, and I just think um, it does a disservice to believers, and it certainly does a disservice to us eternally. So I want to really um, start by giving you a very, very clear framework to kind of hang your thoughts on, and I think it will help you as you read scripture to have this framework too. So we've talked about how your salvation from hell to heaven, um, and that's your, once you believe in what Jesus did for you on the cross, you're saved eternally, and you were given the gift of your salvation and the gift of that eternal security. And then we turn to the opportunity, what we'll call the prize, the opportunity to earn rewards by how we live our life, by how obedient we are, by how brave, frankly, we are to um, live the heroic adventure that he's calling us to and do the sometimes difficult things. So I'm gonna give you um, some different terms and you may like one way to think about it better than another way. Um, but I'm gonna give you some ways, some language around this concept because I do think it's so crucial to our growth as believers and our understanding of scripture to get it, to get it right, to get the framework right. So the most theologically correct terms, the, the long theological words for this are your justification. That's referring to your salvation from hell to heaven. It's like when you're justified or you're made right with God by your simple belief in Jesus. And your sanctification, and that's your growth in Christlikeness. So you've got, on the one hand, you've got justification and sanctification, okay? Another way that people talk about the same basic ideas are the gift and the prize. The gift is your gift of salvation once you believe, and the prize is your opportunity to earn rewards for a life lived in obedience. Um, a third way people will talk about this is your position. Your position is a child of God that can't be affected by anything you do versus your condition. So your condition, like the prodigal son, can be affected by your behavior. You can, you can, cause distance. Um, another way is your relationship. Your relationship as a child of God can't be severed. We talked about that's how um, even our American legal system looks at it. Uh, father cannot disown his child, not legally. He can disinherit his child, so we see the same thing. So your relationship can't be severed, but you can sever your fellowship with God. In other words, you can live in a way, scripture tells us, that grieves the Holy Spirit, you can stifle your prayers, so you can break fellowship, but you can never stop being his child. And then my favorite way to think about this framework is how I title this study. It's security and significance. So once we look to Jesus and his work on the cross as the only hope for our sin sickness, thank you, John 3.15, we're held eternally secure as his child. And I love that analogy of security because like we talked about, um, if you don't understand your security, it doesn't mean that you're not saved. It doesn't mean that you won't necessarily grow um, in your faith or in your walk or become closer to God. But I think if you don't understand your security, you can't, you, um, you'll keep checking it all the time. You'll keep focusing on, am I really saved? And going over and over this first step with God instead of being like, I'm secure, and so now I can be courageous. I can go live a life in faith because I'm not gonna screw it up so badly that he won't call. 
Um, so security and then significance, this opportunity, a, a opportunity, not a guarantee, but an opportunity to live a life of significance that will impact this world and the next. So there's this quote that I think is at the top of your handout this week, but I'm going to read it to you by um, famous 18th century preacher, Jonathan Edwards. He said, for, and he's talking about heaven here, for all shall be perfectly happy. Everyone shall be perfectly satisfied. Every vessel that's cast into this ocean of happiness is full. Though there are some vessels far larger than others. There are different degrees of happiness and glory in heaven, just as there are different degrees among angels, thrones of dominions, principalities and powers, if you will. So there are degrees among saints. The glory of the saints will be in some proportion to their eminency or their effectiveness in holiness and good. So, wow, that quote is, is um, shocking at first, but he's really only saying what the Bible teaches from cover to cover. Our entrance to heaven is predicated solely on the acceptance of Christ's death on our behalf, but our enjoyment of heaven can be greatly enhanced by our response. To it matters so much how we live once we become. And I want you to see that um, God's people in the Bible got this. They understood it. So look at Hebrews 10. And this is the writer of Hebrews, probably Paul. So, For you had compassion on me and my children and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods, knowing that you have a better and enduring possession for yourselves. And then later, the next chapter in Hebrews, he's talking about Moses. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, he looked to the reward. So you think about Moses. Moses says he's looking to reward, and he thought that reward was so worth it that he was worth being reproached in this life and giving up being Pharaoh of what was at that time the greatest riches in the But what exactly was that reward that Moses was looking forward to? What made it worth it to him? And what was the better and enduring possession that the readers of the book of Hebrews were willing to have their whole lives and everything they owned for. What is the prize of accepting the role of hero in your tale rather than declining and sitting this one out or having a cup of tea in your hobbit hole? After all, we know the life of a hero is usually marked by difficulty and trials, and heroism usually comes with a So, we're going to endure the life of a hero, then the potential benefit must dramatically outweigh the, what the very best that this world can offer. And the Bible insists over and over that it does. So I want to look at that, and I want to look at if we believe this, if we believe that God is going to judge our lives, and that we have this potential to impact our eternity by how we live now, then we need to know everything we can about how he's going to judge us, right, and what is exactly at stake and what he's looking for. But before I go on, I want to take just a minute and tell you a little bit about my story and how this truth, when I finally understood this truth, I think the first time I was exposed to it was about um, 1996, and it and honestly, it changed everything for me. Um, and honestly, after my salvation, this has been the most influential or life-changing thing I've ever earned, learned. So I grew up in good churches and in a good home and came to believe very early on that Jesus died for my sins. And um, to tell you the truth, I can't remember a time when I didn't believe that. And I was also taught in churches that I was eternally secure. I was taught and I believed from scripture that I could not be snatched out of his hand. But I think because I believed that, I um, thought I had a one-way ticket to heaven and nothing else honestly mattered. I was, um, I worked pretty hard in school. I was pretty ambitious, pretty achievement oriented. And I was kind of your typical um, work hard, party hard kind of girl to be honest. And in the midst of that, there was still something in me that something I believe was the Holy Spirit that convicted me and told me that I wasn't living right. 
But the only thing I ever heard in church, and maybe it wasn't the church's fault, maybe it was my own hard heart, not listening, not being in my Bible enough, but the only thing that I got at the time, the only way that I heard as a reason for living in a way that pleased God and for sometimes, frankly, making the hard choices to follow him and not just taking the easy and living like I wanted to was, was this. I heard you should follow Jesus, you should obey Jesus out of thankfulness for what he's done for you on the cross and out of your love for him. And I used to hear this phrase, and I don't know, maybe you've heard it too, but the, um, what I heard was, um, make your life a love letter to Jesus. So hear me, because that is true. That is so true. We should live our lives out of thankfulness to what he did for us on the cross. And we should be so motivated by love. But what I came to learn is that's not all that's true. It's true, but it's not all that's true. The story doesn't end there. There is so much more. We're like little kids who need an incentive to obey beyond just being told they should love their mother. We need incentive to change, to grow, to obey, to play the hero's role, the role that's often hard. We talked about that. We talked about how um, people who do heroic things, the reason we watch, the reason we like their stories is because we want to see them overcome those obstacles. And that's how we're living. Psalm 8 actually says the angels are watching us. They're watching because we're living this life of faith, and they're watching to see us overcome. It, so... Um, Until I got that, though, until I understood that it mattered and that I needed to stick it out to win the prize, um, I, it was hard for me to change and hard for me to grow. And my life was honestly marked more by sin than service. But once I finally got it, I started not perfectly, but again to be able to break the cycle of sin, confess, sin again, confess again, and never make any progress or growth in my spiritual life. And honestly, it also gave me this God-given, I think, outlet for my ambition. I finally had incentive to obey and grow and change and understood that ambition could be turned to a higher plane, like a more meaningful plane that would be truly fulfilling and have lasting, not just temporary earthly significance. So I would go to church and I was assured of my internal life in heaven, but sometimes I would see in scripture or sometimes I would hear a sermon that um, talked about the potential of losing our inheritance. Um, and I, what I heard there was losing my salvation. And it didn't make sense with being eternally secure. And so honestly, I kind of chalked it up to just don't understand that, kind of, you know, did this la 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 thing. I'm going to close my ears and I'm not going to deal with that. And when I finally understood this this truth that um, like a child of God, I can't lose that um, relationship, but I can lose fellowship. I do have a potential to lose, to um, squander my inheritance, just like the prodigal son did. It changed everything. Um, I finally understood that I could impact not my position, but I could impact my position, and it, I was radically changed. I still screw up all the time. <laughs> But I have turned motivation and ambition to another source. And I have incentive to obey out of love. Yes, completely out of love, but also, honestly, out of my own self-interest. So now I want to think about what does motivate us and how we are supposed to, um, how we are supposed to live. And I think that our ultimate motivation comes down to three things, kind of like a three-legged stool where you have to have all three components to please God and to be able to even begin to think about living a life that matters and that pleases him and um, will maximize your joy for eternity. So on these three things, the first is love, the second is faith, and the third is rewards or incentive. So first, think about love. I want you to think about um, that father portrayed in the story of the prodigal father, prodigal son that we talked about a couple weeks ago. When you think about that perfect father, your Abba, your heavenly daddy, craning his neck, looking for you, running to you, swooping, up, swooping you up in his arms, kissing you, throwing a family robe around you, welcoming back and loving you, um, 
that can change you. And I think that until we sit and dwell in that, until you really start to understand and comprehend folk on that level of love, you can't really change. I think that that is um, the first most crucial thing. And you have to be filled up with that in order to do anything in love. And we're told that nothing we matter without love, nothing we do without love matters. In fact, um, 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter in the Bible, um, Paul tells us you can do all kind of great things. You can literally give every single thing you own away to feed the poor. You can become a martyr. But if your motivation isn't love, it doesn't matter. Did the same thing in John 15, verses 5 and 9. He tells us there that um, nothing we do will really make a difference. Like nothing is worth it unless we abide in him and in his love. So first love. And the second component is faith. Scripture tells us that without faith, it's impossible to please God. And I think that um, we don't, when I talk about doing good things for God or coming along, I'm not talking about some legalistic system or some rule, list of rules of do's and don'ts, but I'm talking about a life of faith. And like if you look at um, Hebrews 11, which is the Hall of Fame for Christians, right? So if you look at that, every single one in there, it talks about their faith, and that's how they pleased God. It was Moses did it by faith, Abraham did it by faith, Gideon, uh, Deborah, Rahab, the Christians who were martyred. It talks about Christians that were fed to the lions, sawn into all of it by their faith. In fact, it's summed up in Hebrews 11.6, and it says, without faith, it's impossible, impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. So yes, we grow, we change, we obey, we have the courage to do the difficult things we're called to because we're motivated by love and by faith, but also God offers us rewards. Now, I want to briefly deal with the two very common objections that I have heard and I bet you'll hear um, if you bring up this idea of God rewarding us for a heroic life. So they fall into kind of two categories. And the first objection is basically that for everything to be perfectly good, like in order for heaven to be perfectly good, the outcome has to be perfectly equal. The idea is that if it's not equal for everybody, then there'll be envy and strife. But I think we're talking about a different plane. We're talking about a place without sin. Resurrected bodies have shed the sin nature. Jealousy and envy aren't an issue anymore. Jonathan Edwards says, those who are not so high in glory as others will not envy those that are higher, but they will have so great, so strong, and pure love to them that they'll rejoice in their superior happiness. And honestly, this is a relatively new idea, this idea that... Um, to be perfectly happy, we have to be perfectly equal. It honestly comes out of a Mar Marxist socialist worldview that honestly results in everyone being equally miserable. <laughs> but that's a subject for another time. Um, but this idea that we have to be equal in heaven is just not, frankly, in scripture. We do to see degrees of greatness in heaven. First thing I want to hit on is just... Um, that we are, we will, as believers, be held accountable. Um, in 2 Corinthians 5, 9, and 10, it says, We make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. For we must all, and that we is us believers. Paul is talking to the believers at the Corinth, in Corinth, and he says, For we, believers, must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, called the Bema, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he's done, whether good or bad. So we know that we, after we die, will stand before the judgment seat of Christ for our lives to be accounted, for an accounting of our lives. And we do see that there are differing degrees in heaven. We see this a lot, actually. Um, we see this whole idea of some who are last now will be first then, and some who are first now will be last. In fact, that's repeated in Luke, in Mark, and in multiple places in Matthew. Um, Matthew 19, the New Living Translation, says that many who are the greatest now will be the least important then, and those who seem least important now will be the greatest then. 
We see in the parable of the talents that the faithful servants are given different rewards from the unfaithful ones. In Revelation 13, John describes this scene in the temple in Jerusalem where, or, where God is the temple, but um, people have differing degrees of closeness to God depending on their behavior or whether they were a martyr. We see um, Paul's letter to Timothy. Okay, Timothy is obviously a believer and Paul's special protege. Paul warns Timothy to be diligent so he can be approved by God. Again, not his acceptance, not his acceptance as a believer and as a child of God, but his approval. He says, be diligent, Timothy, to present yourself approved to God, a worker who doesn't need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Okay, so the second objection to this idea of our potential to earn eternal rewards goes something like this. Well, I don't need rewards. I'll just, I just love Jesus. That's enough for me. Or I'll just cast any crowns at his feet. <laughs> okay, well, first of all, if there's a crown casting party in heaven, aren't you going to want some crowns to cast? <laughs> but also, this whole, this whole objection um, bothers me. Frankly, I think it bothers me more than the other one because I think it's pride. It's this, um, I don't need rewards. I'm just too godly for that. Um, kind of cloaked in humility. I just love Jesus. But the truth is, um, it doesn't matter what I think. It doesn't matter whether it irritates me. It doesn't matter hubris. It matters what God thinks. And Jesus, you can say you don't care and you won't care, but Jesus tells you to care. In fact, he tells you over and over, over that you should care about these rewards. Um, very obvious one in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and thieves don't break in and steal. And Matthew 5, he says, Blessed are they when they revile and persecute you. In other words, you're blessed if you're persecuted on this earth and people say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. So be exceedingly glad and actually rejoice if you're persecuted for great is your reward in heaven. Um, Matthew 5, 19 says, Whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and keep, teaches them shall be called great. About in Matthew 5, 46, where he's encouraging us to love even our enemies. He said, if you love those who love you, what reward do you get? Um, and then in Matthew 6, he says the same idea about fasting, about prayer, and about charity or um, good deeds. He says, um, take heed that you don't do your charitable deeds before men, to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you do a charitable deed, don't sound a trumpet before you like the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, because they'll get their glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, they've gotten their reward. They've got it. But when you do a charitable deed, don't even let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deed may be in secret, and your Father, who sees in secret, will himself reward you. Matthew 16 says, the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. Um, Romans 2, Christ will render to each one according to his deeds. We even see this in um, Psalm 62. To you, O Lord, belongs mercy, for you render to each one according to his work. Okay, so if we're going to be judged and we have this incredible opportunity, I think it's worth it to take a minute and think about how we'll be judged. Um, first thing to know is that God alone, no one else, just God sets the standard. Um, 2 Timothy 1 says, The Lord grant to him that he can find mercy from the Lord in that day. Mercy from the Lord. Hebrews 4.11, I'm going to skip down to verse 13, or the end of 12, says, He, the Lord, is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart, and there's no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. So I, I love this because I think that when we start thinking about ourselves and um, 
our motivations, sometimes we can't even know. I think we can't even know our own heart all the time and whether we're motivated purely out of good, whether we're motivated out of love or, or something else, but our, but our good Lord knows us perfectly and understands our thoughts and the intents of our heart better than we do. And we are completely and utterly in his hand. The good news is the next point, because we are perfectly and we are ultimately in his hands and his hands alone. The good news is that he is perfect and good and righteous and fair. So I put on your handout this quote from Kevin Kane, and I love it because he has um, combined all these scriptures together to, that describe what a perfect judge God, God is. I'm going to read it to you. The true God we read of in the Bible is a perfect judge. He knows the hearts and minds of men. He searches the hearts of men, knows our every thought. That's Romans 8. Tries our hearts and our minds, Psalm 7. He searches our hearts and understands every plan and thought, 1 Chronicles 28. He can look past the external distractions that so often mislead and look directly into our hearts, 1 Samuel 16. Because of God's ability to know our, th our thoughts, our motives, and the intents of our hearts, he's the perfect judge who exacts the perfect judgment. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Genesis 18. And he shall judge the world in righteousness. He will minister judgment to the people in uprightness. That's Psalm 9. Our God will judge us with all precision, bringing together mercy and wrath perfectly. But with righteousness... <clears throat> He'll judge the poor, reprove with equity the meek, Isaiah 11. And when we pray for forgiveness, only God knows if we're truly sincere, sorry, and changed. Man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. God is a perfect judge. Next, he's going to judge us individually, so we should not compare ourselves to others. This one, I think, um, is a little scary, but also kind of funny. There, there's this... Um, idea in the parable there's this parable in Matthew 20 about a boss who hires some people at the beginning of the day and then with like one hour left in the day he hires someone else and then at the end of the day he gives all of them the same amount of day and as you can imagine the people who started and have been working all day long they come and they complain and the boss says in verse 16 don't I have a right to do with my money what I want to do <laughs> so I think he's telling us um, mind your own business and Keep your mind on your own paper. Um, and look at this, too, <clears throat> about judging us individually. It has this flavor, I think, of um, he knows exactly what opportunities we have, to, and what um, blessings and resources we have, and he will judge us according to that. Look at, um, it's on the top of the third page, I think, of your handout, but at Luke 12, and I'm going to read from the um, New Living Translation this time. And a servant who knows what the master wants, so the servant, this servant knows, he understands, but isn't prepared and doesn't carry out the instructions, will be severely punished. But someone who does not know and then does something wrong, they're only punished lightly. When someone has been given much, much will be required in return. And when someone has been entrusted with much, even more will be required. Honestly, it's kind of a scary thought, I think, for those of us who have been taught a lot, who have Bibles, been in good churches for a lot of years. We um, have a lot to be accountable for, honestly. But let me tell you some good news next. Um, the good news is, and this is something that I just saw a few years ago, honestly, and ever since I saw it, I keep stumping my toe on it in Scripture. I feel like it's just everywhere. And it's the idea that we get to impact the standard by which we're judged. So basically, um, it's up to God. It's ultimately in his court. But somehow, our, um, the amount of judgment we use on other people in this life impacts the judgment he will use to judge us at the Bama seat. So Matthew 7, this is the Sermon of the Mount. He says it very clearly. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged, and the measure you use will be measured back to you. Another translation says, the standard you use in judging is the standard by which you will be judged. And then um, 
also, it's the very heart of the Lord's Prayer. So this is really interesting to me. Um, the Lord's Prayer is what we call a chiasm. It's a it's a structure, a writing structure that was used, and it's it's used a lot in the Bible. And basically, it's where um, the writing is used in a certain pattern. But the point of it is that whatever the author is trying to make the headline, whatever is the major point of the lesson, is put in the very middle. So that's different, right? That's different than how we write in the West or how we talk in the West. Usually in the West, we'll start off and either um, we start in the beginning with our major point, or even more often, we kind of build to it and we close and wrap up with our big point. But that's not how they did it then. It was the main point that they wanted you to get was in the middle. So in the very middle of the Lord's Prayer, we find Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Or some versions say, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And then he finishes the prayer. And then Jesus, as if to say, okay, in case you don't get it, let me say it to you again. Like he puts it right in the middle of his chiasm. And then at the very end of it, he says, then in case they missed it, he says, verse 14, for if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if you don't forgive others your sins, your father will not forgive your sins. We see this in the Old Testament too. Ezekiel 7.27, um, the prophet speaking for God, and the prophet says, God says, I will deal with them according to their conduct, and by their own standards I will judge them. And then I even saw this recently. Um, this actually plays out in the judgment that comes on David after his affair with Bathsheba. Um, so you remember the story of David, right? He has an affair with a married man's wife, Bathsheba. He gets her pregnant and then has her husband killed to try to cover up his sin. So after all this has happened, Nathan, the prophet, comes to him. And I'm going to read you. It's not in your handout, but I'm going to read you what Nathan says to David. He comes in. So the Lord sent Nathan to David. This is 2 Samuel 12 came into David and he said, there were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a large number of sheep and cattle. The poor man had nothing except one little lamb he had bought. He had raised it, grew up with him and his children. This little lamb shared his food, drank from his cup, and even slept in his arm. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler. Instead, he took the little lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come. So David burned with anger against this man. David's irate when he hears the story and he says, as surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. He has to pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had Nathan, David said, you are that man. And later, we see that David loses four sons. The exact same judgment he wanted exacted on the man in Nathan's story was the same judgment leveled against him. He lost the baby that he had with Bathsheba and then three more. What incentive what incentive this is to live with patience, kindness, and forgiveness, and mercy toward everyone, especially, especially those who hurt. Um, so let me conclude. We should be motivated by love. We should act in faith. And we should earnestly seek the rewards that God offers. Hebrews 12 describes this life that we're on now as a race. Verses 1 and 2 said, Therefore we also, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that's set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. 2 Corinthians 9, Paul says, don't you know that we all, all in a race, all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? So run in such a way to get the prize. Pray we'll think about all these motivations then this week and the rest of our lives running to win.
Let me pray and then I'll see if there are any. Um, Lord, thank you so much for this truth. Thank you for your mercy on us. Thank you that you promise us in 1 John 1, confess our sins. Um, you forgive us for those sins. I believe that um, if we do that, if we confess, we are not held accountable for them at the judgment seat. I believe we can also have a easier time there by being merciful day in and day out. Oh Lord, please help us remember these things. Help us act in love, walk in faith, and run the race to seek the rewards that you offer. Jesus. Okay, let me see if, see if there's anything there. Um, Jeff, I can't even see my chat box. There it is. Okay. Um... Oh, you put Second Samuel 12 yeah. in there. Thank you. For reference for everyone. Yes, good. Thanks so much. Um, no questions tonight. Okay, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. If you think of something, uh, you can email me this week or ask me next week. Love seeing you all here, and thanks to everybody who's watching later online. And you guys have a great week. Thanks.